Um, part of the Hornblower family of companies uh, uh, is one of our new business units starting uh, Niagara Cruises, and we're actually launching vessels today into the Niagara Gorge. Uh, the, 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 the ice has subsided enough to actually put our new vessels into the water, and he's there. So uh, once again, it is wonderful to be here. Uh, it's great to be able to be part of such a dynamic, wonderful, uh, growing waterfront. Um, you know, if you look at this sliver in time, I'd say it's maybe one of the most exciting times to be a New Yorker and be here. The redevelopment of Hudson River Park Trust, uh, uh, the seaport, the, 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 the waterfront park esplanade uh, at Pier 15, which we're really excited about starting operations in this year. Um, just really a great time, and we thank you all for being here with us. Uh, our crew are on board today. If you have any questions about Hornblower, anything we do, anything we should be doing together as partners, feel free to grab myself. Again, my name is Cameron. Our event manager is Sharon Dash, uh, and we'd be really uh, love to talk uh, more with you uh, about Hornblower or anything that we may be able to do together. Roland, thank you very much for having us again here with you. I, uh, I'm the president of the, uh, the MWA, uh, but I do have a, a bosses and they're, they're wonderful. I have an amazing board of directors, and uh, you'll be actually privileged to, to meet a bunch of them on board today. They have a little thing that says board on their uh, name tag, um, and you'll also hear some of them leading uh, panels and uh, uh, doing other, other activities uh, throughout the day. And to start us off, to welcome us, welcome you on behalf of the board is uh, our vice chairman, uh, uh, retired Colonel John Boulay who was a, 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 a head of the Standard Recovery and Resilience Team at Parsons Sprinkerhoff, and as many of you know, went, uh, head of the Army Corps right here in, in New York Harbor for, for years before he went to the private sector. And now, so report, and he's going to here to introduce our keynote speaker, my, my chairman, Chris Ward. So a round of applause for John Boulay. Thank you, Roland. And, uh, on behalf of my esteemed colleagues in the uh, Board of Directors, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance is an organization of over 800 other organizations that come together to discuss waterfront, harbor, and estuary issues. You know, our goal is to enable the protection, the transformation, and the revitalization of our harbor, of our estuary, and of our waterfront. And we think uh, really what we need to do that in a proper way is we need idea engines. And that's what this waterfront conference is all about. We're on a very large boat vessel if you're uh, in the maritime services. And don't worry about the winds, we have the Coast Guard on board. <laughs> uh, so we're all set. We've got the deputy captain of, of, of the port all on board with us, so feel safe, enjoy yourself. Um, but this conference really, which is the premier regional waterfront conference, is designed to have debate, have discussion about the issues of the day so that when policies are formed, implementation is being done in the various uh, sectors and factions and, and projects that we're interested in, we can, we can shape how that happens through the idea engines of this waterfront conference. So the board is very excited all of you could join us today, and thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to do something. Now what I'd like to do is introduce uh, our, our, our guest speaker, our keynote speaker today, and a very special treat uh, for all of you. Uh, I have a pleasure, really, of, of introducing one of my mentors from my time in government service, uh, someone who has served uh, the city and the region for much of his adult life, someone who is an insider in every way when it comes to waterfront issues, someone who is a visionary leader who understands big pictures and understands how to integrate uh, the drivers uh, that, that we're faced and the challenges that we have to come up with solutions that are truly holistic and comprehensive. Uh, someone who is inspirational and has motivated and led very large groups, including being executive director of the uh, Port Authority here. And I say there's lots of port authorities around the world, but there's only one real Port Authority that you can call the Port Authority. <laughs> That's the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. When I'm, up, when I'm in New Jersey, I call it the Port Authority of New Jersey and New York. <laughs> but I want to introduce really uh, a visionary leader, someone I have the utmost respect for, who's going to talk a little bit about 
what he thinks the future of the Port Authority, the Port Authority is, and that's uh, Chris Ward. So please join me in a round of applause for Chris Ward. off to kind of a rough start because when I jumped in the cab to get here I said Pier 40 and the cab goes yeah Chelsea Piers and I then was on the phone and got dropped off at Chelsea Piers <laughs> and luckily a cab pulled in at just the right minute and I made it down to your Pier 40 so um, it's great to be here and it's a wonderful day and there's much to talk about and um, there will be a number of panels later but um, I would really like to take this opportunity as Roland said to comment and talk about the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Uh, let me start by what, telling you what I'm not going to talk about and then actually talk about what I am going to talk about. Obviously, we all know the elephant in the room here, which has been the Bridgegate scandal, which has unfolded and grown and grown and grown. And uh, with that, it's come all sorts of calls for reformation of the Port Authority, transformation of the Port Authority change in structure, transparency, all that um, has been played out in the newspapers and the media. Um, but if history, I think, has taught us anything, um, I think we've learned that people will do stupid and illegal things regardless of the structure that they function in. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the stupid and potentially illegal things that have occurred lately. Um, the only thing I comment on that is, I hope all that we know is over now and sort of say enough. Um, and hopefully that what we've been reading and hearing about is over. But with that self-examination, I think it's important for all of us to sort of step back and come to grips with what is the Port Authority and what has it done and where is it today and where it might go in the future. And that's really what I would like to talk about. Because in many respects, the way the Port is understood has in fact been behind in some ways a bureaucratic veil um, and has not today integrated itself as you would like into the, the public culture, the public dialogue. But to understand and think about that, I think we need to step back a bit and think about why the Port Authority was created. Um, because it's only in understanding that creation that I think we can make meaningful steps for how we go forward given the challenges that we face. So the Port Authority, <clears throat> born clearly out of the progressive era, think of the amount of divisive politics that was going on in New York City and the country in that period in the turn of the century. Um, so you have all these divisive politics and then you have rampant government corruption. Um, Tammany Hall, New Jersey, just rampant corruption. And so the progressive era suddenly emerges in response to that, uh, that crisis and out of that comes the notion of institutions that guard the public good. And the Port Authority was created for that. Um, and in some respects it was created in that, not to be sexist, but in that great man notion of history back then where you would gather together leaders, people who were thoughtful, who were leaders, and who were part of a, of a sense of the future, and you'd put them in a location and protect them from corruption. You would, you would isolate them in many respects, and you would allow them to develop what would be good for the region because access in some ways back then meant potentially corruption. Um, but the most important thing that the Port Authority was created for was obviously the monopoly of the railroads and the disfiguration of the region given the pricing of moving goods across the, um, the Hudson River. So you, we created this incredible institution to solve all sorts of those problems and the very things today that we are in some respects objecting to the lack of transparency was a function of fighting the very challenges that were necessary to create the institution. And think about what that institution did. Um, besides the MTA, I would argue that the Port Authority has essentially built New York City's aspirations from obviously the, <clears throat> the bridges and the tunnels to the port, uh, and we will be talking about the port much, much more today, but really the aspirational vision of what a city could become over time. Uh, the airports and the growing challenges of the aviation industry. And as that unfolded, the Port Authority model worked incredibly well. Um, in fact, I would argue that the introduction of its success was really its financial capacity, the vision of creating an independent agency using tolls and fares to build these 
incredible um, pieces of infrastructure was successful and the Port Authority grew out of that success larger and more powerful. Um, and the introduction, in fact, of that success, the wealth of the Port Authority, I think begins to end up taking it from its fundamental mission because as the, the economy in the United States was growing in the post-World War II era, the Port Authority was prospering tremendously as well. The explosion of the, the automobile <coughs> driving, pardon me, in this region, sent revenues for the Port Authority, you know, skyrocketing. And with that wealth became challenges of where will the Port Authority and where will it go, having built the assets that it had so we'd all so desperately needed. And wealth, in a sense, created a new set of visions um, at a time when the economy was starting to see some fractures in terms of um, its, its ability to continue to grow out of World War II. So what ends up happening? Um, the leaders of the Port Authority look around and wonder, where is the mission statement in this growing world with wealth, with the assets that had already been built? You know, the ports were, were largely built. The airports were growing and changing. But there were not transformative projects <clears throat> within the port region at that time, at the same time that the Port Authority had wealth. So what happens? You end up getting into a period when the world economy is changing, and the Port Authority has money, and people begin to realize we need to get away from kind of the isolationist economic model that we faced before and enter a new era. And what is that era? The era of incredible world trade, incredible expansionism. We've come out of the isolationism of World War II. And everybody's saying the economy is going to grow by growing into an international world. So out of that comes the World Trade Center, which many people would argue is the bellwether for how the Port Authority began to lose its mission within transportation. And I'm not going to argue whether that did or it didn't, but clearly the aspirational goal of a transformative project with the wealth that the Port Authority had transformed <laughs> the World Trade Center and transformed Lower Manhattan. Um, and with that, <clears throat> you began to see the Port Authority, as people have said, move beyond the core transportation missions. But I would argue that it was driven in many respects by its wealth. Um, so the World Trade Center goes up. Um, the Port Authority is continuing to prosper, do well, and the city is beginning to decline. You've begun to see the major depressions, I would argue, after the Vietnam War in 76. Municipal revenues are way down, and people start to then begin to think, well, if the Port Authority can build the World Trade Center, what other ideas are out there that we might end up asking this now influential and wealthy institution to undertake? So out of that idea, comes a two sets of projects that I think many of us would acknowledge today have borne remarkable fruit for um, this region. And that's the two waterfront projects, the one in Hoboken and the one over in Queens West. Remember back before, for those of you who are old enough, what those two waterfronts looked like 30 years ago. Um, they were the classic decrepit, underdeveloped, unaccessible waterfront that we know. And today, Hoboken has been transformed by those projects as well as Queens West. Um, and that was part of an economic vision to revitalize New York at a time of, of uh, economic decline. Uh, and it took a really long time and it was very difficult, but they were successful. Um, and think also of the work that Peter Goldmark, one of the great executive directors that the port ever had. He's executive director just at a period when the economy is really now in a major slide. The African-American community is cut off from the economic opportunity that they had thought in the migration to New York City. Jobs are at, um, at a low point. We're struggling with a depression recession cycle. So Peter thinks, how do we end up revitalizing this region? And his, his ideas are, we need growth. And where will that growth be? So we end up getting into the industrial development model of the Port Authority, where the Yonkers Industrial Park <clears throat> and other job creation initiatives were undertaken. Again, drifting out of what that notion of a core mission is for the Port Authority, but answering with financial capacity and wealth a crucial economic you know, question for the city. And over time, those projects, candidly, as much as Peter threw his heart and soul into them, did not become the kind of drivers of, a, of, a, of an industrial economy in Yonkers and in Brooklyn and, and Queens. <coughs> 
But nonetheless, it was a function of the Port Authority within this political environment and the economic challenges that the city was facing. So now you have <clears throat> the Port Authority beginning to now financially head in the other direction. The World Trade Center is draining lots of money out of the Port Authority. The path system is growing increasingly subsidized, <coughs> while the bus terminal, when it was first built, was a money maker with its relationship with New Jersey Transit. Um, revenues are now dropping, and the financial capacity of the Port Authority is beginning to flatline and beginning to diminish. Um, but the elected officials who face a far larger economic problem um, still see the Port Authority as a potential solver of their economic problems. So, you know, one of the public moments that uh, everybody is aware of is Mario Cuomo to plug a major financial hole in the New York State budget, does a swap payback on the aqueduct um, uh, racetrack with the Port Authority and generates, at that time, seemed like a lot of money, but about $86 million. And so then, the governors are beginning to think, well, <clears throat> what can the Port Authority do to help solve my economic problems? And the notion of developing banks, if you will, to solve some of those problems uh, for the states begin to emerge out of their economic challenges at the same time that the Port Authority has capacity, but it's diminishing. <clears throat> so out of that, out of that tension that we've created an institution that was protected from corruption and that it's its very structure was intended to protect it from influence. Um, we've begun to see major, major political decisions on how that money should be spent. Um, and the influence of how that money should be spent gets increasingly, increasingly politicized <coughs> and gets more and more difficult. Because the financial underpinning of the Port Authority, its toll and fare structure, is now proving inadequate. And the frequency of tolls and fares become far more frequent. And no elected official ever wants to discuss tolls and fares. And that the, the, the challenge of raising revenue for tolls and fares and solving the political problem becomes incredibly supercharged. So that in order to get buy-in to raise tolls, you're making political decisions on what you would use that money for and how it would end up being spent. Um, so banks are created to build political consensus. Special projects are developed for priorities within each state, and the Port Authority is drawn into this incredible dialogue of what we should be and where the money should be spent. But remember that the Port Authority in this time period is slowly losing its ability to generate revenue because it's in projects that are not generating a financial return. Excuse me. So over this time period, the Port Authority does begin to reveal itself. The word transparency, which we now take as a watchword of everything that we do, is integrated into the Port Authority. And you do, in fact, begin to see the opening up of how it makes decisions, how, it's, um, public, how it publicly reviews its projects, et cetera. But it's also occurring at a time where the, the emergence of the deep, deep, cynical perspective on what government does and what it can do is growing rapidly, that the anti-government movement as we are facing this financial you know, crisis, ironically, you have this anti-government movement at the very time that the Port Authority is losing financial capacity. Um, and that anti-government movement is generating the sort of sense that is government part of the problem? And so we begin to lose in that framework public confidence in these large institutions. You're late, sorry. Um, <clears throat> you missed the great beginning. So we're, 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 we're seeing this trend of anti-government, a deep sort of sense of cynicism, cynicism of what government can do, um, at the same time that the Port Authority is struggling to become transparent and, and deal with it, um, and, and begin to have a conversation with the community and where it might end up going. But all three and four of these things are occurring in an incredibly complicated political environment of prioritization, public culture, discussions of what government should do, and they're all going in some respects in different and wrong directions. Um, so here you have this large institution that was created out of a progressive notion. At the same time, you have a growing anti-government perspective. You have a politicalization of the agency because of its wealth, and then ironically at a time when it's no longer generating the kind of money that it ends up needing. Um, and so this toll and fare structure ends up becoming more and more charged and more and more challenging. And people will talk about the Port Authority having this enormous financial capacity, 
and that's true. But also, all of those assets now are now churning tremendous amounts of uh, the need for state of good repair and keeping things up at the same time that the money losing operations are getting continu continuously challenged. So <clears throat> it brings us up to today. It brings us up to a moment when the Port Authority has had to go through a major toll and fare increase um, at a time when there's these competing priorities of how it should operate. And that last toll and fare increase was sort of the pinnacle, if you will, of the combination of politics, revenue, revenue and political influence. And out of, out of that, I would argue, is that we've created this crisis of confidence of who, who really controls the Port Authority, where is its money being spent, and how it should be allocated. Um, and I think those are all very, very legitimate questions in this new era now where we are facing what, with, without enough money to do the things we know we need to do, how are we allocating those resources and are we doing it in a way that is good for the region and not simply a matter of regional politics to solve interstate or statewide, statewide issues. So how do you transform an agency that was built to, to avoid the very problems that now we're asking it to become? to become more transparent, to talk more openly about its financial capacity, to deal with the decision making on how resources should be allocated. That is where we are today. It's not that the Port Authority is fundamentally flawed. It's not a matter that the Port Authority can't do what it's supposed to do. I would argue that the Port Authority hasn't changed and what has changed very, very dramatically is the political culture that it needs to function in. And it would be foolish not to acknowledge that that political climate has changed, but it would be equally foolish to disband, to disrupt, in some way undermine this incredible institution which has built itself to a level of delivery for this region that no other institution or governmental agency has been able to do anywhere else here in the region and I would argue elsewhere. So where does, where does that leave us today? What should we be really focusing on when we want to think about whether the Port Authority? Um, I would start with, I think one of the most fatal flaws of the structure of the Port Authority today was born out of a very, very difficult moment between Governor Whitman and Governor Pataki. When Governor Pataki selected George Marlin to be the executive director of the Port Authority, New Jersey re rejected the idea and a political compromise was, was made when New Jersey was able to select the deputy executive director of the Port Authority. So the, the classic check and balance is that New Jersey controls the board through the chairman and that New York controls the executive director um, was broken and that you now introduced another element into the governance of the Port Authority which is the deputy executive director which is a political appointment from New Jersey. And I would argue that that is inherently a corrupting decision because it brings in not someone who is there for the purposes of management to make the sort of day-to-day -day deputy executive director-like decisions for the institution, but rather it's a political watchdog answering political questions of what's good for New Jersey. And so once you've introduced that position, you've lost and broken the checks and balances that you had with a strong commission and a strong executive director and a strong chairman of the board. So in terms of what we should now be doing with the Port Authority, I would argue strongly that that position be depoliticized. The other reality is that the Port Authority has hesitated and structurally has been enabled to really discuss candidly with the region its financial capacities for the very idea and problem of the politicians <coughs> were using it to solve their, their political needs locally in both, in both states. So when people talk about transparency, um, I think the Port Authority must face the need, the fundamental need, to finally reveal how its financial structure, in fact, works and, and bring before the public on an annual basis its financial forecast, its capital plan, and its long-range forecast for expenditures. That needs to be part of a public process right now. Um, and that is actually fairly simple to do. In some respects, the Port Authority does a lot of that now, um, but not enough. Um, and so I think that in terms of really bringing the public into what the institution does, there must be a new, new financial structure that is revealed regularly to the public. Um, but beyond that, uh, 
there's not a magical retransformation of the Port Authority to suddenly miraculously solve what people think is this inherent corruption within its structure. Its structure is not inherently corrupt or in inherently incapable of communicating with the, the community and politicians at large. It can do that and it should do that and that we shouldn't think that there has to there be some radical breakup of the Port Authority to solve what is really a financial and public disclosure issue rather than a political structure that is incapable of ever answering those questions publicly. But the bad news, <clears throat> the bad news is the public is not going to want to see where the Port Authority is today. Because where the Port Authority is today, it's no longer that wealth engine that we fundamentally need. Um, where the Port Authority was prospering and doing well, it, it, it perhaps left its core mission. The problem now is the Port Authority's capital capacity is flatlined. Um, Pat Foy, you know, to his enormous credit, has made it clear that the Port Authority could spend its entire capital capacity on state of good repair, starting no new projects. Um, there would be no aspirational goal for the Port Authority if it simply did state of good repair. So now we're in a situation where <clears throat> how do we take the Port Authority, reveal to the public its financial capacity, and speak candidly about what we can't do? Um, and does the financial model of the Port Authority meet the needs of the region today? And I would argue that it doesn't, that we do not, the Port does not have the kind of capacity to build aspirational projects anymore. And why? Because again, we've overburdened it with projects that don't have any return, um, and we've overburdened it with mission creep. Um, but you are not going to miraculously create more wealth in the Port Authority simply by changing its financial structure. <clears throat> Pardon me. So today, the conversation needs to be more transparency, reveal the Port Authority, let people know the challenges that it's faced, understand that the model of tolls and fares sustaining it is probably not working anymore, um, the revenues are flatlined, and how do we then build a new institution which has financial capacity going forward? Because we do need aspirational projects. We do need to build a new LaGuardia Airport. We do need to build you know, a mass transit system across our waterways as we'll talk about ferries. We do need to think about what the next airport capacity is going to be. But there is today simply not enough money to begin to develop those projects. So with transparency, I would hope there would also become public engagement for how do we make sure that there is the financial capacity to build the next generation of transportation core projects. But it's not going to suddenly emerge out of a restructuring of the Port Authority. It is only going to emerge by people like this group beginning to articulate we have an incredible challenge on our waterfront and to really solve that is fundamentally about revenue and vision and implementation as John Boulay said this morning. So for all of us, the question for the Port Authority is how do we bolster the confidence that's been broken, unfortunately, out of things like Bridgegate, bolster the confidence, the compact between the public and an institution, and begin to say we need to figure out how to raise more revenue, and we need to have a, a regional vision for how it should be spent, and then we need to have an implementation structure that people buy into. And unfortunately, I'm somewhat on the downward side of optimism these days that I don't see for all of the call for transparency, a regional political culture that is willing to make those kind of hard decisions and make those kind of hard judgments on how you're going to build a new port authority. Um, and I think that for the Waterfront Alliance here is our fundamental challenge. How do we create a political sense that this is a, a world that we can create, that we can build a new and vital waterfront, and the port authority can continue to be that engine, but without the relationship between support, transparency, and revenue, we're only going to be arguing in a world of scarcity. And scarcity is what drives people apart, and scarcity is what creates political conflict, and wealth and generation of economic development is fundamentally what brings people together. But there are good things that are still happening through all of these, you know, these cynical news stories that we end up hearing. The Port Authority does endure. Um, Chris Zeppi, who's here today, uh, let me know that one of, the, one of the great projects of the Port Authority, the restoration projects of our harbor, 
got reauthorized for $60 million. And that is just, come on, is a, is a, is a, great, a great example of combining regional needs, financial capacity in a small way, um, but, in an, but in an important way. So hopefully out of this conference comes the kind of dialogue that elected officials see and understand that the Port Authority needs to be transparent, but it needs to be part of what we're all working on together. And it should not be the problem. We cannot lose the institution, given all the challenges that we face, because of some short-term political and idiotic things that happened, and at the same time, somehow think that that's a reflection of an institution that's fundamentally flawed. The only way I think you can do that, as John Boulay was saying, is idea engines, which is driving this region with bold new ideas that people understand will improve their lives, will take this city, this region, to an even larger scale, an even more productive, integrated scale, but understanding that now it's a much more complicated political world and also a much more contextual world for balancing all of the competing issues that we end up facing. But I end with the idea that we will make a huge, huge mistake if we think that first somehow structure creates financial capacity or better, better delivery um, and that Bridgegate is a function of an institution which is fundamentally flawed. The challenge for the Port Authority is ability to build the aspirational projects that we all want and a political support that without a new economic model of generating wealth, of extracting wealth out of this incredible economy to fund the kind of infrastructure we want, we will continue to battle each other over an environment which is defined by financial scarcity. Thank you very much.